That's all that we discussed. Mean that for each of our devices, we need to obtain a globally unique IP address? Is that even possible given the number of devices we connect to the internet every day? We use a simple approach to addressing, which is called network address translation, NAT. This provides the opportunity of keeping a range of network addresses private while exposing them to the rest of the world using a single public IP address. For example, in the figure, we have a router with two interfaces. One interface has an IP address of 10.0.0.4. It is connected to a range of addresses within the network 10.0.0.0/24. The other interface has the IP address of 138.76.29.7. This IP address is public and known and used by the rest of the internet. All of the devices within the private network are known to the rest of the world through one IP address, 138.76.29.7, even though they each have a unique IP address in the 10.0.0.0/24 range. Okay, how is that possible? And why is that useful? First, let's answer the question of why NAT is useful. Within a private network, we might want our devices to move freely, change IP addresses. We might also prefer to avoid giving out the IP addresses of each device to the rest of the world. This might be for security reasons. On the other hand, we may want to change ISPs without wanting to change configuration for each of our devices within the private network. Using NAT would perform all of that only one public IP address for a range of addresses behind the NAT. The devices inside the local network will not be publicly visible. Now, let's answer the how question. How does NAT work? A NAT-capable router uses an address translation mechanism to perform this. On an outgoing datagram, a NAT-enabled router replaces source IP address and port number to NAT IP address and a newly assigned port number. The remote hosts in the internet that are talking to the device behind the NAT will respond using NAT IP address and this new port number as the destination address. The NAT translation table will keep track of the mapping of the source IP address and port number to this NAT IP address and the new port that was used. For the incoming datagrams, the NAT-capable router replaces the NAT IP address and new port number in the destination fields of every incoming datagram with corresponding source IP address and port number that was registered before. This is done through consulting with the stored entries that were written upon outgoing datagrams in the NAT table. Let's review our example with further details. Suppose host 10.0.0.1 sends a datagram to 128.119.40.186, port 80. The port used at the source is 3345. The NAT-capable router replaces the source IP address of 10.0.0.1 and source port of 3345 with IP 138.76.29.7 which is the public IP address of NAT, and the new port 5001. It registers the mapping between the source IP and port values between the public IP and the newly assigned port and the original source IP and port number at the NAT table. When the reply arrives, the reply by the remote server is destined for 138.76.29.7 port 5001. At this point, the NAT-capable router would consult the NAT table and forward the datagram to the host 10.0.0.1 and port 3345. NAT uses 16-bit port numbers in addition to the IP address for addressing of a host. 
This creates the possibility of two to the power of 16 connections having a single public facing address. However, that is controversial. This has many reasons. The first one is that routers usually process up to layer three. This mechanism, NAT, brings layer four, the port, into the addressing decision and into the routing processing. Second, NAT complicates the discoverability of addresses behind the NAT for applications like peer-to-peer. -peer. What if a server is behind the NAT? Another argument is that address range problem of IPv4 could be resolved by using IP version 6. Part of the controversy is due to the argument of need to move towards IPv6 instead of using NATs. 